Thought Vibration, or the Law of Attraction in the Thought World. Part 4, Chapters 13 to 16. Chapter 13 The Attractive Power, Desire Force. We have discussed the necessity of getting rid of fear, that your desire may have full strength with which to work. Supposing that you have mastered this part of the task, or at least started on the road to mastery, I will now call your attention to another important branch of the subject. I allude to the subject of mental leaks. No, I don't mean the leakage arising from your failure to keep your own secrets. That is also important, but forms another story. The leakage I am now referring to is in that occasioned by the habit of having the attention attracted to and distracted by every passing fancy. In order to attain a thing, it is necessary that the mind should fall in love with it, and be conscious of its existence, almost to the exclusion of everything else. You must get in love with the thing you wish to attain, just as much as you would if you were to meet the girl or man you wished to marry. I do not mean that you should become a monomaniac upon the subject and should lose all interest in everything else in the world. That won't do, for the mind must have recreation and change. But I do mean that you must be so set upon the desired thing that all else will seem of secondary importance. A man in love may be pleasant to everyone else, and may go through the duties and pleasures of life with good spirit, but underneath it all he is humming to himself, just one girl and every one of his actions is bent toward getting that girl, and making a comfortable home for her. Do you see what I mean? You must get in love with the thing you want, and you must get in love with it in earnest. None of this latter-day flirting, on today and off tomorrow sort of love, but the good old-fashioned kind, that used to make it impossible for a young man to get to sleep unless he took a walk around his best girl's house, just to be sure it was still there. That's the real kind. And the man or woman in search of success must make of that desired thing his ruling passion. He must keep his mind on the main chance. Success is jealous. That's why we speak of her as feminine. She demands a man's whole affection, and if he begins flirting with other fair charmers, she soon turns her back upon him. If a man allows his strong interest in the main chance to be sidetracked, he will be the loser. Mental force operates best when it is concentrated. You must give to the desired thing your best and most earnest thought, just as the man who is thoroughly in love will think out plans and schemes whereby he may please the fair one, so will the man who is in love with his work or business give it his best thought, and the result will be that a hundred and one plans will come into his field of consciousness, many of which are very important. The mind works on the subconscious plane, remember, and almost always along the lines of the ruling passion or desire. It will fix up things, and patch together plans and schemes, and when you need them the most, it will pop them into your consciousness, and you'll feel like hurrahing, just as if you had received some valuable aid from outside. But if you scatter your thought force, the subconscious mind will not know just how to please you and the result is that you are apt to be put off from this source of aid and assistance. Beside this, you will miss the powerful result of concentrated thought in the conscious working out of the details of your plans. And then again, the man whose mind is full of a dozen interests fails to exert the attracting power that is manifested by the man of one ruling passion, and he fails to draw to him persons, things, and results that will aid in the working out of his plans, and will also fail to place himself in the current of attraction whereby he is brought into contact with those who will be glad to help him because of harmonious interests. I have noticed in my own affairs that when I would allow myself to be sidetracked by anything outside of my regular line of work, it would only be a short time before my receipts dropped off and my business showed signs of a lack of vitality. Now many say that this was because I had left undone some things that I would have done if my mind had been centred on the business. This is true, but I have noticed like results in cases where there was nothing to be done, cases in which the seed was sown and the crop was awaited. And in just such cases, as soon as I directed my thought to the matter, the seed began to sprout. 
I do not mean that I had to send out great mental waves with the idea of affecting people. Not a bit of it. I simply began to realize what a good thing I had, and how much people wanted it, and how glad they would be to know of it, and all that sort of thing, and lo, my thoughts seemed to vitalize the work, and the seed began to sprout. This is no mere fancy, for I have experienced it on several occasions. I have spoken to many others on the subject, and I find that our experiences tally perfectly. So don't get into the habit of permitting these mental leaks. Keep your desire fresh and active, and let it get in its work without interference from conflicting desires. Keep in love with the thing you wish to attain. Feed your fancy with it. See it as accomplished already, but don't lose your interest. Keep your eye on the main chance, and keep your one ruling passion strong and vigorous. Don't be a mental polygamist. One mental love is all that a man needs, that is, one at a time. Some scientists have claimed that something that might as well be called love is at the bottom of the whole of life. They claim that love of the plant for water causes it to send forth its roots until the loved thing is found. They say that the love of the flower for the sun causes it to grow away from the dark places so that it may receive the light. The so-called chemical affinities are really a form of love, and desire is a manifestation of this universal life-love. So I am not using a mere figure of speech when I tell you that you must love the thing you wish to attain. Nothing but intense love will enable you to surmount the many obstacles placed in your path. Nothing but that love will enable you to bear the burdens of the task. The more desire you have for a thing, the more you love it, and the more you love it, the greater will be the attractive force exerted towards its attainment, both within yourself and outside of you. So love but one thing at a time. Don't be a mental Mormon. Chapter 14 The Great Dynamic Forces You have noticed the difference between the successful and strong men in any walk of life, and the unsuccessful weak men around them. You are conscious of the widely differing characteristics of the two classes, but somehow find it difficult to express just in what the difference lies. Let us take a look at the matter. Burton said, The longer I live, the more certain I am that the great difference between men, the feeble and the powerful, the great and the insignificant, is energy and invincible determination, a purpose once fixed, and then death or victory. That quality will do anything that can be done in this world, and no talents, no circumstances, no opportunities will make a two-legged creature a man without it. I do not see how the idea could be more clearly expressed than Burton has spoken. He has put his finger right in the centre of the subject. His eye is seen into the heart of it. Energy and invincible determination. These two things will sweep away mighty barriers, and will surmount the greatest obstacles and yet they must be used together. Energy without determination will go to waste. Lots of men have plenty of energy, they are full to overflowing with it, and yet they lack concentration, they lack the concentrated force that enables them to bring their power to bear upon the right spot. Energy is not nearly so rare a thing as many imagine it to be. I can look around me at any time and pick out a number of people I know who are full of energy, Many of them are energy plus, and yet, somehow, they do not seem to make any headway. They are wasting their energy all the time. Now they are fooling with this thing, now meddling with that. They will take up some trifling thing of no real interest or importance, and waste enough energy and nervous force to carry them through a hard day's work, and yet, when they are through, nothing has been accomplished. Others, who have plenty of energy, fail to direct it by the power of the will toward the desired end. Invincible determination, those are the words. Do they not thrill you with their power? If you have something to do, get to work and do it. Marshal your energy, and then guide and direct it by your will. Bestow upon it that invincible determination, and you will do the thing. Everyone has within him a giant will but the majority of us are too lazy to use it. We cannot get ourselves nerved up to the point at which we can say, truthfully, I will. If we can but pluck up our courage to that point, and will then pin it in place, 
so that it will not slip back, we will be able to call into play that wonderful power, the human will. Man, as a rule, has but the faintest conception of the power of the will, but those who have studied along the occult teachings know that the will is one of the great dynamic forces of the universe, and, if harnessed and directed properly, it is capable of accomplishing almost miraculous things. Energy and invincible determination, aren't they magnificent words? Commit them to memory, press them like a die into the wax of your mind, and they will be a constant inspiration to you in hours of need. If you can get these words to vibrating in your being, you will be a giant among pygmies. Say these words over and over again, and see how you are filled with new life, see how your blood will circulate, how your nerves will tingle. Make these words a part of yourself, and then go forth anew into the battle of life, encouraged and strengthened. Put them into practice. Energy and invincible determination. Let that be your motto in your workaday life, and you will be one of those rare men who are able to do things. Many persons are deterred from doing their best by the fact that they underrate themselves by comparison with the successful ones of life, or rather, overrate the successful ones by comparison with themselves. One of the curious things noticed by those who are brought into contact with the people who have arrived is the fact that these successful people are not extraordinary after all. You meet with some great writer, and you are disappointed to find him very ordinary indeed. He does not converse brilliantly, and, in fact, you know a score of everyday people who seem far more brilliant than this man who dazzles you by his brightness in his books. You meet some great statesman, and he does not seem nearly so wise as lots of old fellows in your own village, who waste their wisdom upon the desert air. You meet some great captain of industry, and he does not give you the impression of the shrewdness so marked in some little bargain-driving trader in your own town. How is this, anyway? Are the reputations of these people fictitious? Or what is the trouble? The trouble is this. You have imagined these people to be made of superior metal, and are disappointed to find them made of the same stuff as yourself and those about you. But, you ask, wherein does their greatness of achievement lie? Chiefly in this. Belief in themselves, and in their inherent power, in their faculty to concentrate on the work in hand when they are working, and in their ability to prevent leaks of power when they are not working. They believe in themselves, and make every effort count. Your village wise man spills his wisdom on every corner, and talks to a lot of fools, when if he really were wise, he would save up his wisdom and place it where it would do some work. The brilliant writer does not waste his wit upon every corner, in fact, he shuts the drawer in which he contains his wit, and opens it only when he is ready to concentrate and get down to business. The captain of industry has no desire to impress you with his shrewdness and smartness. He never did, even when he was young. While his companions were talking and boasting and blowing, this future successful financier was sore on wood and saying nothing. The great people of the world, that is, those who have arrived, are not very different from you, or me, or the rest of us. All of us are about the same at the base. You have only to meet them to see how very ordinary they are, after all. But don't forget the fact that they know how to use the material that is in them, while the rest of the crowd does not, and, in fact, even doubts whether the true stuff is there. The man or woman who gets there usually starts out by realising that he or she is not so very different, after all, from the successful people that they hear so much about. This gives them confidence, and the result is they find out they are able to do things. Then they learn to keep their mouths closed, and to avoid wasting and dissipating their energy. They store up energy, and concentrate it upon the task at hand, while their companions are scattering their energies in every direction, trying to show off, and let people know how smart they are. The man or woman who gets there, prefers to wait for the applause that follows deed accomplished, and cares very little for the praise that attends promises of what we expect to do some day, or an exhibition of smartness without works. One of the reasons that people who are thrown in with successful men often manifest success themselves is that they are able to watch the successful man 
and sort of catch the trick of his greatness. They see that he is an everyday sort of man, but that he thoroughly believes in himself, and also that he does not waste energy, but reserves all his force for the actual tasks before him. And, profiting by example, they start to work and put the lesson into practice in their own lives. Now what is the moral of this talk? Simply this, don't undervalue yourself or overvalue others. Realize that you are made of good stuff and that locked within your mind are many good things. Then get to work and unfold those good things and make something out of that good stuff. Do this by attention to the things before you and by giving to each the best that is in you, knowing that plenty of more good things are in you ready for the fresh tasks that will come. Put the best of yourself into the undertaking on hand and do not cheat the present task in favour of some future one. Your supply is inexhaustible and don't waste your good stuff on the crowd of gapers watchers and critics who are standing around watching you work. Save your good stuff for your job, and don't be in too much of a hurry for applause. Save up your good thoughts for copy if you are a writer. Save up your bright schemes for actual practice if you are a businessman. Save up your wisdom for occasion if you are a statesman. And in each case, avoid the desire to scatter your pearls before well, before the gaping crowd that wants to be entertained by a free show. Nothing very high about this teaching, perhaps, but it is what many of you need very much. Stop fooling and get down to business. Stop wasting good raw material and start to work making something worth while. Chapter 15. Claiming Your Own in a recent conversation, I was telling a woman to pluck up courage and to reach out for a certain good thing for which she had been longing for many years, and which, at last, appeared to be in sight. I told her that it looked as if her desire was about to be gratified, that the law of attraction was bringing it to her. She lacked faith, and kept on repeating, Oh, it's too good to be true, it's too good for me. She had not emerged from the worm of the dust stage and although she was in sight of the promised land, she refused to enter it because it was too good for her. I think I succeeded in putting sufficient ginger into her to enable her to claim her own, for the last reports indicate that she is taking possession. But that is not what I wish to tell you. I want to call your attention to the fact that nothing is too good for you, no matter how great the thing may be, no matter how undeserving you may seem to be. You are entitled to the best there is, for it is your direct inheritance. So don't be afraid to ask, demand, and take. The good things of the world are not the portion of any favoured sons. They belong to all, but they come only to those who are wise enough to recognise that the good things are theirs by right, and who are sufficiently courageous to reach out for them. Many good things are lost for want of the asking. Many splendid things are lost to you because of your feeling that you are unworthy of them. Many great things are lost to you because you lack the confidence and courage to demand and take possession of them. None but the brave deserves the fair, says the old adage, and the rule is true in all lines of human effort. If you keep on repeating that you are unworthy of the good thing, that it is too good for you, the law will be apt to take you at your word and believe what you say. That's the peculiar thing about the law. It believes what you say. It takes you in earnest. So beware what you say to it, for it will be apt to give credence. Say to it that you are worthy of the best there is, and that there is nothing too good for you, and you will be likely to have the law take you in earnest and say, I guess he is right. I'm going to give him the whole bake shop if he wants it. He knows his rights, and what's the use of trying to deny it to him? But if you say, Oh, it's too good for me. The law will probably say, Well, I shouldn't wonder, but that, that is so. Surely he ought to know, and it isn't for me to contradict him. And so it goes. Why should anything be too good for you? Did you ever stop to think just what you are? You are a manifestation of the whole thing, and have a perfect right to all there is. Or, if you prefer it this way, you are a child of the infinite, and are heir to it all. You are telling the truth in either statement, or both. At any rate, no matter what you ask, you are merely demanding your own, and the more in earnest you are about demanding it, 
the more confident you are of receiving it, the more will you use in reaching out for it, the surer you will be to obtain it. Strong desire, confident expectation, courage in action, these things bring to you your own. But before you put these forces into effect, you must awaken to a realization that you are merely asking for your own, and not for something to which you have no right or claim. So long as there exists in your mind the last sneaking bit of doubt as to your right to the things you want, you will be setting up a resistance to the operation of the law. You may demand as vigorously as you please, but if you will lack the courage to act, if you have a lingering doubt of your right to the thing you want, if you persist in regarding the desired thing as if it belonged to another instead of to yourself, you will be placing yourself in the position of the covetous or envious man, or even in the position of the tempted thief. In such a case your mind will revolt at proceeding with the work, for it instinctively will recoil from the idea of taking what is not your own. The mind is honest. But when you realize that the best the universe holds belongs to you as a divine heir, and that there is enough for all without your robbing anyone else, then the friction is removed and the barrier broken down, and the law proceeds to do its work. I do not believe in this humble business. This meek and lowly attitude does not appeal to me. There is no sense in it at all. The idea of making a virtue of such things when man is the heir of the universe and is entitled to whatever he needs for his growth, happiness and satisfaction. I do not mean that one should assume a blustering and domineering attitude of mind. That is also absurd, for true strength does not so exhibit itself. The blusterer is a self-confessed weakling. He blusters to disguise his weakness. The truly strong man is calm, self-contained, and carries with him a consciousness of strength which renders unnecessary the bluster and fuss of assumed strength. But get away from this hypnotism of humility, this meek and lowly attitude. Remember the horrible example of Uriah Heep, and beware of imitating him. Throw back your head, and look the world square in the face. There's nothing to be afraid of. The world is apt to be as much afraid of you as you are of it, anyway. Be a man or woman and not a crawling thing. And this applies to your mental attitude as well as to your outward demeanour. Stop this crawling in your mind. See yourself as standing erect and facing life without fear, and you will gradually grow into your ideal. There is nothing that is too good for you, not a thing. The best there is, is not beginning to be good enough for you, for there are still better things ahead. The best gift that the world has to offer is a mere bauble compared to the great things in the cosmos that await your coming of age. So don't be afraid to reach out for these playthings of life, these baubles of this plane of consciousness. Reach out for them, grab a whole fistful, play with them until you are tired. That's what they are made for anyway. They are made for our express use, not to look at, but to be played with, if you desire. Help yourself. There's a whole shop full of these toys awaiting your desire, demand, and taking. Don't be bashful. Don't let me hear any more of this silly talk about things being too good for you. Pshaw! You have been like the Emperor's little son, thinking that the tin soldiers and the toy drum were far too good for him, and refusing to reach out for them. But you don't find this trouble with children as a rule. They instinctively recognize that nothing is too good for them. They want all that is in sight to play with, and they seem to feel that the things are theirs by right. And that is the condition of mind that we seekers after the divine adventure must cultivate. Unless we become as little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The things we see around us are the playthings of the kindergarten of God, playthings which we use in our game tasks. Help yourself to them. Ask for them without bashfulness. Demand as many as you can make use of. They are yours. And if you don't see just what you want, ask for it. There's a big reserved stock on the shelves and in the closets. Play, play, play. To your heart's content. Learn to weave mats, to build houses with the blocks, to stitch outlines on the squares, to play the game through and play it well. And demand all the proper materials for the play. Don't be bashful. There's enough to go round. But remember this. While all this be true, the best things are still only game things. 
toys, blocks, mats, cubes, and all the rest. Useful, most useful for the learning of the lessons, pleasant, most pleasant with which to play, and desirable, most desirable for these purposes. Get all the fun and profit out of the use of things that is possible. Throw yourself heartily into the game and play it out. It is good. But here is the thing to remember. Never lose sight of the fact that these good things are but playthings, part of the game, and you must be perfectly willing to lay them aside when the time comes to pass into the next class, and not cry and mourn because you must leave your playthings behind you. Do not allow yourself to become unduly attached to them. They are for your use and pleasure, but are not a part of you, not essential to your happiness in the next stage. Despise them not because of their lack of reality. They are great things relatively, and you may as well have all the fun out of them that you can. Don't be a spiritual prig standing aside and refusing to join in the game. But do not tie yourself to them. They are good to use and play with, but not good enough to use you and to make you a plaything. Don't let the toys turn the tables on you. This is the difference between the master of circumstances and the slave of circumstances. The slave thinks that these playthings are real, and that he is not good enough to have them. He gets only a few toys because he is afraid to ask for more, and he misses most of the fun. And then, considering the toys to be real, and not realising that there are plenty more where these came from, he attaches himself to the little trinkets that have come his way, and allows himself to be made a slave of them. He is afraid that they may be taken away from him, and he is afraid to toddle across the floor and help himself to the others. The master knows that all are his for the asking. He demands that which he needs from day to day, and does not worry about overloading himself, for he knows that there are lots more, and that he cannot be cheated out of them. He plays, and plays well, and has a good time in the play, and he learns his kindergarten lessons in the playing. But he does not become too attached to his toys. He is willing to fling away the worn-out toys, and reach out for a new one, and when he is called into the next room for promotion, he drops on the floor the worn-out toys of the day, and with glistening eyes and confident attitude of mind, marches into the next room, into the great unknown, with a smile on his face. He is not afraid, for he hears the voice of the teacher, and knows that she is there waiting for him, in that next great room. Chapter 16 Law, Not Chance Some time ago I was talking to a man about the attractive power of thought. He said that he did not believe that thought could attract anything to him, and that it was all a matter of luck. He had found, he said, that ill luck relentlessly pursued him, and that everything he touched went wrong. It always had, and always would, and he had grown to expect it. When he undertook a new thing, he knew beforehand that it would go wrong, and that no good would come of it. Oh, no, there wasn't anything in the theory of attractive thought, so far as he could see. It was all a matter of luck. This man failed to see that by his own confession he was giving a most convincing argument in favour of the law of attraction. He was testifying that he was always expecting things to go wrong, and that they always came about as he expected. He was a magnificent illustration of the law of attraction, but he didn't know it, and no argument seemed to make the matter clear to him. He was up against it, and there was no way out of it. He always expected the ill luck, and every occurrence proved that he was right and that the mental science position was all nonsense. There are many people who seem to think that the only way in which the law of attraction operates is when one wishes hard, strong, and steady. They do not seem to realize that a strong belief is as efficacious as a strong wish. The successful man believes in himself and his ultimate success, and, paying no attention to little setbacks, stumbles, tumbles, and slips, presses on eagerly to the goal, believing all the time that he will get there. His views and aims may alter as he progresses, and he may change his plans, or have them changed for him. But all the time he knows in his heart that he will eventually get there. He is not steadily wishing he may get there. He simply feels and believes it, and thereby sets to operation the strongest forces known in the world of thought. 
The man who just as steadily believes he is going to fail will invariably fail. How could he help it? There is no special miracle about it. Everything he does, thinks, and says is tinctured with the thought of failure. Other people catch his spirit and fail to trust him or his ability, which occurrences he in turn sets down as but other exhibitions of his ill luck, instead of ascribing them to his belief and expectation of failure. He is suggesting failure to himself all the time, and he invariably takes on the effect of the auto-suggestion. Then, again, he, by his negative thoughts, shuts up that portion of the mind from which should come the ideas and plans conducive to success, and which do come to the man who is expecting success because he believes in it. A state of discouragement is not the one in which bright ideas come to us. It is only when we are enthused and hopeful that our minds work out the bright ideas which we may turn to account. Men instinctively feel the atmosphere of failure hovering around certain of their fellows, and on the other hand recognize something about others which leads them to say, when they hear of a temporary mishap befalling such a one, Oh, he'll come out all right somehow, you can't down him. It is the atmosphere caused by the prevailing mental attitude. Clear up your mental atmosphere. There is no such thing as chance. Law maintains everywhere, and all that happens, happens because of the operation of law. You cannot name the simplest thing that ever occurred by chance. Try it, and then run the thing down to a final analysis, and you will see it as the result of law. It is as plain as mathematics. Plan and purpose, cause and effect. From the movements of worlds to the growth of the grain of mustard seed, all the result of law. The fall of the stone down the mountainside is not chance. Forces which had been in operation for centuries caused it. And back of that cause were other causes, and so on, until the causeless cause is reached. And life is not the result of chance. The law is here, too. The law is in full operation, whether you know it or not, whether you believe in it or not. You may be the ignorant object upon which the law operates, and bring yourself all sorts of trouble because of your ignorance of, or opposition to the law, or you may fall in with the operation to the law, get into its current, as it were, and life will seem a far different thing to you. You cannot get outside of the law by refusing to have anything to do with it. You are at liberty to oppose it, and produce all the friction you wish to. It doesn't hurt the law, and you may keep it up until you learn your lesson. The law of thought attraction is one name for the law, or rather for one manifestation of it. Again I say, your thoughts are real things. They go forth from you in all directions, combining with thoughts of like kind, opposing thoughts of a different character, forming combinations, going where they are attracted, flying away from thought centers opposing them. And your mind attracts the thought of others, which have been sent out by them consciously or unconsciously but it attracts only those thoughts which are in harmony with its own. Like attracts like, and opposites repel opposites in the world of thought. If you set your mind to the keynote of courage, confidence, strength and success, you attract to yourself thoughts of like nature, people of like nature, things that fit in the mental tune. Your prevailing thought or mood determines that which is to be drawn toward you, it picks out your mental bedfellow. You are today setting into motion thought currents which will in time attract toward you thoughts, people, and conditions in harmony with the predominant note of your thought. Your thought will mingle with that of others of like nature and mind, and you will be attracted toward each other, and will surely come together with a common purpose sooner or later, unless one or the other of you should change the current of his thoughts. Fall in with the operations of the law. Make it a part of yourself get into its currents, maintain your poise, set your mind to the keynote of courage, confidence and success, get in touch with all the thoughts of that kind that are emanating every hour from hundreds of minds, get the best that is to be had in the thought world, the best is there, so be satisfied with nothing less, get into partnership with good minds, get into the right vibrations, you must be tired of being tossed about by the operations of the law, Get into harmony with it. End of thought vibration or the law of attraction in the thought world. Recording by Algie Pug, Perth, Western Australia.